Well, hey there, and welcome to the Apartment Building Investing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Blank. Super excited that you're here. If you want to quit your job, become financial free, you want to use real estate as a, as a, as a vehicle, then go right into apartment buildings. And so uh, today's guest is Jeremy Lemire. Let's get right into the interview. Here we go. I really just needed to surround myself with folks that had the mindset that it can be done, that we have done it. My personal network that didn't exist. Ultimately, I really moved out of my local market and into a national uh, platform, uh, attending various different seminars. That's when I was really ex exposed to your program, Michael. That really opened up the pool of individuals to start net networking with and being able to understand that th this is all well within reach. Uh, and if you could leverage your strengths, you could clearly find a place to be able to expand and broaden and, and be able to encompass an entire you know, portfolio of multifamily properties and, and be successful at it. It wasn't new, it just was, I wasn't exposed to the individuals that were just like me that were doing it. Hey Jeremy, welcome to the show today. Hey Michael, great to be here. It's great to have you here. I feel like I've known you for a long time, which I, th I think I have, but uh, you are literally like one of the first students of ours that has now come back and not only become financially free, but has now become a mentor uh, teaching others how to become financially free as well. And I've seen you come full circle. I have seen your, your family on stage uh, receiving the Freedom Hall of Fame award. It's been amazing to watch you uh, from, from where you came and, and now you're scaling your platform by you know, building your, your uh, platform up to raise millions in days. It's just amazing uh, how, where you've come over the last few few years. And so I just want to kind of, you know, I want to see kind of how things started, obviously. And uh, tell us, uh, Jeremy, what was going on at the time? When was this where you started thinking about real estate? Like what was going on yeah. in your life at the time? And, and why were you even thinking, starting to think real estate? Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting. It, it really does go through with the life stages that you have. You know, I started out back in 2000 eight after, you know, the, the big great recession and watching my 401k just kind of collapse while at, while at my full-time job. Uh, and I was traveling the globe at the time, you know, so I, I'd been in China, Indonesia, Vietnam, you know, all South America, South Africa, you know, just around the globe and spent a lot of time committed to my, my full-time job and really said, I'm just going to kind of save as much as I can save. And as I do that, my, my real goal is to be able to start a business down the road, but uh, we were going to have kids at some point and th th all this travel needed to stop and things like that. And then about 2008, 2009, uh, I really had to take a second look at saving and just saving for savings sake. You know, when, when half of it disappeared, it really made me look and go, I missed out on a lot of things in life while I waited for that, uh, waited for that to try to grow up to something and then to have it shrink all the way back, you know, 10 years worth, what felt like 10 years worth. Uh, it, was, it was really an eye-opening point. And that's really what got me into uh, looking at alternative investments uh, besides the stock market. So you were frustrated by, by the, your basic net worth collapsing during the recession and that's yeah. when you start scratching head going is there anything else i can invest in and so what did you come up with initially what was your plan back then yeah so at that point i really started to look at uh just kind of buying local real estate you know so i started uh in 2009 late 2009 we started looking at duplexes and things that were within what i could really handle myself and that i felt i was comfortable with uh, expanding the portfolio and the price point was, was really at the right entry point based on my portfolio being where it was and only being able to migrate some of my capital into real estate. So I, I started uh, in 2010, we bought our first two duplexes, kind of January, February-ish. And uh, really with the Great Recession, I ran into a financing problem at that point. Um, you know, I was using uh, one of the larger banks because that's where I went and had my mortgage at. And in using those conventional kind of financing means, I really ran into a wall where we went to buy our third property and we were denied. And it was like, how can we, I mean, we have all kinds of cash flow. Why is this a problem? Well, it was just strictly, you know, the Great Recession limitations of you can only have two loans with us. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's that's right. Now, did you start liquidating your some of your stocks to invest in real estate, or were you just, uh, or were you just saving and putting that into real estate, or both? I did. I I had funds uh, inside my four hundred one k, and I had funds outside of my four hundred one k that were all in the stock market, and well, you know. Well, hold on. Let's not gloss over that because I remember the, distinctly when I called up my financial advisor, I said, "Oh, uh, today I'm selling everything." And I probably put that call off for weeks. I'm like, I'm not going to call this guy. Like, how were you able to call uh, whoever was that stockbroker, your financial advisor and go, hey, guess what? We're selling everything today. Yeah. So in my own, uh, in my own, potentially my own enemy in that is, uh, you know, I, I was just an E-Trade investor. So inside of my 401k, I just had a portfolio in E-Trade. So it was a decision that I was going to exit stock market start liquidating and transferring into alternative, you know, um, investment account, my local bank account and re ready those funds for these types of things. And that, that was really that I didn't really have to sell my broker from that standpoint. I had to sell my wife more than anything. I was going to ask I, you about that, right? Because, <laughs> you know, she sees the, the, the stock portfolio and it's pretty much certain as, as I guess certain as a stock market can be. And here's the husband selling everything uh, and plowing into something that uh, you know you have you have no experience in or so how did she how did she react to that and how did you deal with that yeah she you know this entire time with uh the whole savings you know just putting money away and and kind of i don't want to say living a frugal life but just always knowing that those first dollars are the hardest to get but once you get them working for you uh, that was always the benefit whether it was the stock market whether it turns out to be real estate uh, that that was our number one goal. She she respected that up front, and we had done quite well with what we had amassed you know, by that point in time, and so it was a little bit of conversation about we're going to enter into real estate, and it really was a, you know, from from my, from her standpoint, you're going to have to take care of this, uh, because I don't know anything about it, and I'll learn as we go. But for now, you know, prove prove the way on it, and we can certainly uh, test the waters there. That was really the starting point. Uh, then, you know, I, I, when I ran out of funds, then it became a question of now, what do I do? You know, there's got to be some other way. And I unfortunately locked up all my money in my 401k for all those years. And now it was, huh, there's got to be a way to do this because, you know, all the, all the higher level uh, individuals have 401ks and they're doing something more than just, you know, investing in the stock market. And at that point, you know, open up the uh, open up the Google page and start trying to search for various different ways that I can use my 401k funds to invest in real estate and how it could be done. And thankfully, uh, even at that point, you know, 2010, 2011, there was a good amount of information populating the internet that that allowed me to the entry point to start expanding into uh, self directed IRAs. Yeah, so you started using uh, using your stock, uh, stock portfolio savings and 401k and, and you use that as a way to get into active real estate investing by buying duplexes. And you bought a couple, and then you were kind of stopped by the banks at, at the two duplexes. You wanted to buy a third. How did you overcome uh, that, and what was next? Yeah, so at that point, I had to find identify a different bank that I could actually work with. So we were able to we were able to find – we actually ended up going through credit unions. And um, once I started that process, uh, most of my – most of my financing now is actually done through the credit union side. Even in some of my, multi, my I'll call it smaller multifamily stuff, uh, the credit union has a large enough portfolio now where, you know, a $2 million, $3 million property is an acceptable investment for them. Yeah, so you, pushed, you went down the path of single family houses or even duplexes. What, what other stuff did you do? Yeah, uh, so at that point, we, we really started to um, run out of the cash after we bought and invested within our 401k. We, again, we ran out of the, the liquid, the liquidity. So at that point, I actually started flipping properties uh, to generate one-time cash uh, with the sole intent that the goal would be to, uh, to, to buy a property, rehab it, sell it. And every other one, we were really scheduled to take that set of funds and put it into the next property and actually turn it into a rental. And we had great opportunities back in 2012, 13, 14 to, to acquire single family properties that were distressed price points and be able to basically, uh, in the end, I ended up burying them into a position of high equity but very little capital in it long term. So I could keep rotating through this and build up a portfolio and as, as appreciation kept happening, we just kept being able to balloon our portfolio 
uh, through those one-time burrs and every once in a while just picking up a, a multi or a single family or duplex property and adding it to the portfolio. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a, the burr method is, is, is great. You know, it's like, I'm going to buy one every single year and, uh, and then within 10 years I'll have 10 properties and I can retire and that'll be my retirement fund. That's actually a great plan, you know, but yep. for some reason you don't have, uh, you have other stuff. Now you actually transition into multifamily, some other assets. Why yep. did you start expanding your scope? Yeah. So I really 2000, uh, 16, 17, you know, I had been working still in my full-time job, just, just pounding away, you know, along with doing the burr type stuff in between, but pounding away at my full-time job with uh, expansion, the company I worked for had been growing significantly for a long time. And we continue to continue to grow like that. But all of a sudden in that growth strategy, I wasn't included in that, I'll call it expansion. So about uh, three years ago, I got, uh, got into a position where I was passed over for a promotion. And uh, unbeknownst to me, it was never communicated what, what the reason was for that. But what I recognized out of that was, you know, I had expected real estate to kind of get me out of the full-time job position by the time I was 55. It was really my goal. And uh, it, was a, it was a goal that my dad always wanted to achieve. And so it was like, well, if he can do that, I certainly should be able to do that. I'm, you know, we've been saving and doing the things that we needed to do. So as long as we were diligent about it, 55 was kind of the goal. And how well, old were you at the time? Just so you know. Uh, uh, I was about 43, 44 at the time. So you had a 10, 10, 10 12 year uh, time horizon. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And it, we were, we were going to clearly be on track to that because the, the reality was in that point in time, my mindset was, ah, uh, you have the classic million dollar portfolio and your, you know, the, the earnings that you have on that in, in kind of a, uh, in our local market, it really was an opportunity that you could retire with, with the million dollars and, and be able to do kind of a few things here and there and, and, and have all that, you know, effective retirement activity. But, um, you know, when, when the situation happened where I was passed over for a, for a promotion into a position that was created, I realized that I wasn't going to get promoted. It was no opportunity for me to grow, if you will, uh, from a professional standpoint. So at that point, my goal became much bigger. It became, you know, my 55 goal really got advanced up to 45, which was kind of the two-year milestone. Um, so at that point, you know, I've I knew you that I wasn't going to do it through up, the uh, Jeremy. You must've been pretty fed up to go from 12 to two. <laughs> I, I was, you know, it, it was, I had invested a lot of hours in uh, lots of weekends uh, in my full-time job. And, you know, it was clear that I wasn't going to see the payback on, on that anymore. So at that point it was, I need to do what I can control, which was the real estate side and seeing where we were at that point in time. I could clearly see that the, the very pronounced and diligent growth, you know, month over month with rental income and the, you know, at the time you could see the appreciation happening uh, with the values that you were having to buy houses at. So you knew that the stuff that you had already acquired was appreciating. So I, I really just took that and extrapolated it out and said, I just need to get this to a point where I can replace my full-time income and and I know that I'm not going to be able to accomplish that. And I'm a little bit of a control side on my, on my single family and, and duplex properties, you know, where I, I do, a, I do self-manage my assets. So it was really, I knew I had to get big enough, fast enough to put people in place to help me uh, carry that long-term and be able to eliminate my full-time job because I, I do have a good, well-paying full-time job. Yeah, that's right. So you decided to shift to, uh, to larger properties uh, multifamily specifically at the time. What did you do to get started? Yeah, so I, I did start saying to myself, I need to do something bigger. And I was afraid, you know, I had friends that had uh, looked at, you know, four unit, six unit, eight unit properties. And that was just, that was too big, you know, mentally. Um, and really what, what I learned out of that process of, of growth and exploring how to get bigger faster was, I really just needed to surround myself with folks that had the mindset that it can be done, that, that we have done it. And, and I, my personal network, that didn't exist. 
So ultimately, I really moved out of my local market and into a national uh, platform, uh, attending various different seminars. And ultimately, that's when I was uh, um, kind of through the Google search stuff and looking for that type of program. That's when I was really ex exposed to your program, Michael. And that really opened up the pool of individuals to start net networking with and being able to understand that th this is all well within reach. Uh, and if you could leverage your strengths, you could clearly find a place to be able to expand and broaden and, and be able to encompass an entire you know, portfolio of multifamily properties and, and be successful at it. It wasn't new, it just was, I wasn't exposed to the individuals that were just like me that were doing it. So you felt like if you can just talk to people who have done it, it would increase your confidence and your comfort zone. Yep. Yeah. I, you know, I, I kind of, I can buy real estate. That's not an issue, but how do I manage it? How do I deal with all the other complexities? How do I deal with the scale? And, and talking through those things with people that are very knowledgeable with it really is all that it took for me to start to take those, those little pods and pieces that I knew and kind of network them all together into a solution that really provided me the opportunity to say, I have the confidence that even I can do this on my own if I need to for smaller properties. Uh, and if I want to do a larger property, I certainly understand now the team that I need to put together uh, in order to actually accomplish the, 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 the bigger package, you know, a 200 plus unit. There's a general thinking out there that uh, investing in single family house for five plus years will give you the confidence to go to multifamily which is weird because um, it didn't happen for me. And it sounds like it didn't happen for you because otherwise you would have said, oh, yeah, we can raise money. We can get into this stuff. Uh, now, on the other hand, once you start, got started um, and you, I think you, you joined our mentoring program, so you started working with one of our full-time syndicators. So how long did it take you to believe that you could do this? Yeah, I really went into a very calculated process of timing, right? I have, I have an engineering background. So for me, it was like I had to, I have to plan and really – you know, within a couple months was my target, right, of starting something. So I kind of did my, my research of what program I wanted to be part of, what fit me from a personality standpoint, you know, and, and really had the elements that, that I needed. And joining your program really got me launched into the point, and it was flexible enough where I was able to enter when I wanted to enter, that fit. I had two, uh, three young kids at the time, toddlers at the time. So, that, you know, I'm juggling my full-time job, I, the real estate we do have, and I want to get into the syndication thing and, and bigger multifamily. So it's like, this stuff all has to be very structured again, to balance with my personal time, my wife's personal time and keep sanity uh, it, as we progress in the growth, in the growth state. So in it really, I aligned it to January uh, of 2018 to, to really enter the multifamily space and be focused on it. So that's when I started the coaching. And at that point, I knew that I was going to follow the program and I was going to start executing. I was going to talk to brokers and we're going to find something. And uh, by, by the end of February, March, uh, we had identified an asset that uh, several people had looked at, but the asset wasn't really you know, it, it didn't pencil out on numbers, but when we actually looked at it in more detail and did some market research, we realized that there was a lot of value to be unlocked in this property. We just had to, we just had to be comfortable with the fact that everything around this property defined what this property could become. And when we did that, you know, we, we, we actually made an offer for the property uh, at a price point that no one else was willing to offer. We acquired, ended up acquiring that asset a couple months later and within three months, we took that property from about 82% occupancy up to about 98, 99% occupancy. And we've been hovering 98 to 100% occupancy for two years steady. So it was huge in the value that we created and the cash flow that I was able to turn from that property. Jeremy, it's so interesting because people always say this market is so hot and now COVID and this and uh, people are overpaying, which they are. But, you know, we've had a similar experience where we paid essentially asking, which, of course, in, in our market typically is outrageous because asking is always outrageous. Yeah. Uh, but the only reason we've been able to do it is because we sharpened our pencil to really identify opportunities that the, the regular buyer may not may not see at all. Uh, and that makes all the difference. So what how how did you even go about uncovering opportunity? What was the opportunity that other people didn't see? 
Yeah, they, you know, they assumed, I think, that, that you know, the, the existing operator was really operating as, you know, in a normal mode. And when I actually did some phone calls around, I'm like, why is the occupancy so low in this property? You know, I, I visited the property and saw a few of the units and started calling around and everybody was at 100% occupancy. And uh, uh, we, we couldn't identify why these units were any different and not being filled. But we knew that, hey, we just have to be more targeted about occupancy. And, you know, in the end, it turned out that within two months, we identified that the, the property manager that the existing uh, owner had been using, because it was a uh, not locally managed property. So they, they, their primary assets were about 60 miles away and they owned this particular asset and had an on-site property manager but they were not very flexible with showings their sourcing for the leads that they were doing showings for were unfavorable source points for tenants i mean i'll give you an example uh you know when the the person that was the the property manager was actually uh working at a bar and bringing individuals from the bar as tenants wasn't exactly the most economical or uh, financially viable candidate because- no resourceful. Yeah, but they were resourceful, right? Uh, looking for the easy leads, but they tended to be problematic tenants, uh, you know, with pay, I'll call paycheck to paycheck and less visibility of where next month's rent's coming from. And because they weren't flexible enough in what they were doing from a showing standpoint, you were missing out on, on a, a whole pool of candidates that when we started managing the property and we started managing it via property management software and sending it out to a broader distribution, we actually brought in a much better tenant base and at a much lower, much lower cost. Well, hold on, Jeremy. How did you find all this out? There's all this information about the bar and the leasing and all that stuff. Yeah, so yeah, so that all that all uncovered itself within the within the two months after we took ownership of it. So in reality, I took a I don't want to say a leap of faith, but we just knew that we had to do our due diligence and execute the process properly, and we should be able to fill these units. But within the two months after, that's when we identified the sourcing that were coming in with the leads was prop was problematic. But you knew there was a gap in in vacancy and possibly rent by actually calling on the other apartments, right? Correct. That's how you discovered that, right? Correct. Because yep. you're not gonna get that by looking at comps on on the on the marketing package, right? So you actually went out there, Correct. possibly drove around, definitely called around, and you yep. essentially shopped the comps. You're like, wait a minute, all these guys are full and this one's not. Yeah. You know, yeah. what is going on there? And then your conclusion yep. was that it must be a management problem that you could solve. Yeah, yeah, and and we just said these are the focus points that we have to do over the first couple of months. Mm -hmm. Understand where this gap is, and we had some business plans where, you know, maybe it's a problem with the quality of the units. So we actually had a, had one uh, one opportunity to uh, actually improve the quality of the unit. We put a new appliance package in, and and uh, did a complete paint job and things like that, and pushed the rents even higher because. That was the other element of it that we were really trying to identify is could we improve our price point in the market to also drive rent up in all of these units that we're turning. So we kind of were watching both elements. One is a market test for a, for a value add from a true rent. And the other was to eliminate the vacancy issue and get to a market competitive occupancy rate. Uh, and in seeking both of those things, we really were actually were able to achieve both of them. So you were able to essentially pay uh, asking price based on actual NOI, and how is that property doing now? Yeah, now we are we are generating we are probably pushing rents on average about twenty percent above when we purchased the property. Mm. So, on any unit that was being vacated, they were they were being re rented at literally at twenty percent above where the previous tenants were. So every time I had a turnover there was a profitability opportunity for me. Uh, I, morally and ethically, I don't push my tenants and I don't, uh, you know, my goal isn't to say, hey, somebody who's here at a $500 price point, we're automatically gonna move you to 600, 700. You know, that, that's, that, that's not what I buy a property under the plan to do. 
but I will absolutely capitalize on it if I have a turnover situation that, that it makes sense. And we will progressively move the existing tenant base towards that target at something higher than inflation, but I'm not gonna push them out of the market, but they can understand that we are gonna, we are gonna make, um, you know, make accommodations and slowly migrate them to the actual market rate. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and you create a lot of value in the, in the, in the process. So at what point did you uh, actually quit your job then, Jeremy? Let's talk about that. Yeah, so I, I actually got to the point where, you know, I started working with my team to, out, I don't know, I would say replace me effectively. My, my ultimate goal in my full-time job was to make myself invisible and eliminated. Uh, and that, that really generated the opportunity because, you know, I work in a professional occupation and the last thing I wanted to do was leave my team hanging in a situation where they weren't, weren't ready to handle the things on their own. Uh, similar to any, any other individuals that I work with on my team from the, from the multifamily side, I, I want to work with capable people. I hire capable people and empower them to do the things that need to be done. And it ultimately got to the point where I, I really am not needed in my full-time job so I can be gone. And at that point, my, my team doesn't suffer in their objectives for the year. And I, there's no ill will about, you know, exiting the, exiting the full-time job. So they're off running, the company is fine and I'm off doing my, my, my portfolio that, that uh, I want to handle as a full-time job. Well, I recall you kind of ease yourself out of the job very slowly and, and gingerly where, I, if I remember correctly, you were, I don't know, working half the time or even less and getting paid the same amount of money. And you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. it's such a sweet deal. I can't leave this job. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> it does. It does leave handcuffs, especially when you have that flexibility. But like I said, with, with building the right team, uh, interestingly, it really starts to gear itself uh, the behaviors, as I, as I uh, later read the four-hour work week, it was really interesting to hear all of the, the tactics and strategies. And it's like, ah, yep, I used a good number of those in order to accomplish what I was trying to accomplish as I migrated to the, to the uh, uh, real estate side exclusively. What was your last day like, Jeremy? Was it a non-event or was it kind of weird? It, in the end, it's a non-event. It's just like you just stopped doing the emails that you used to do, the very few that were left. Yes, yeah, so you kind of ease your, your family into this lifestyle as well. But, you know, how did your wife react to, to all this? You know, I, I, lots of days she thinks I'm crazy. Other days she thinks I should have quit sooner. You know, I, I in, in a way, I enjoy a lot of the, the, the activities that I have to really find a way to shut them off you know, and step back and, and do the other activities, you know, the, whether it's vacation oriented things, because mentally for so many years, I've been so focused on just doing, doing, doing and making things happen. And when you're successful at doing that, it really isn't, it really doesn't feel like it's that much of a work scenario, you know, so it just became, I'm just doing, 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 and I could fit in some vacations and we have a lake house. So I was able to fit in weekends um, and actually I would say this year we probably have more opportunity to be at the lake house, you know, than any other year for the last 12 or 13 years since we've had it. Uh, so it's been fantastic to be able to enjoy that stuff. Uh, and, you know, we've continued to expand our portfolio. And at the same time, I've continued to add, you know, the resources where I need them, whether it's contract or full time uh, on my, on my side in order to free up time to, to be able to step away on the weekend and only have to handle a couple of emergency phone calls or something like that and still get everything done. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, a lot of us are, are driven, you know, and, and here's the thing, the difference is we were working hard before and we're working hard now. The difference is you're building leverage, right? You're building equity, you're building cash yeah. flow. And finally the stuff you did last year is paying dividends today where in my job, I always felt like, well, what I did last year, no one cares now what I did last year. That's gone. Like that's yeah. water under the bridge. And I really love that. You know, what are some of the other ways that your life is different now than when you were working full time? I, I, I think the, the real interesting things have been how I've been able to help other people. You know, I've really crossed over this to this point now where uh, I, I'm a subject matter expert in several different kind of elements, whether it's kind of in the rehab, because we do a lot of renovations on our, on our portfolio and bring those, bring those to market at a much higher price point. So some of that expertise is always requested from individuals. I have a lot of uh, uh, time that I can spend outside of actual real estate related things now, so I can help family members do other things. 
Uh, so I've got lots of things happening from that perspective as people are, are trying to figure out how to do something more with, with their life even, you know, what, how can they do something similar to what I've done? So there's, there's that coaching element going on about, you know, kind of career oriented things, you know, where do you want your career to go? And how can you turn that into something, you know, similar to what you're saying, how can you turn that into something that benefits you year over year rather than just this year for the paycheck? So that's where I started, you know, kind of spending a little bit more of my time into the mentoring and coaching elements, whether it's in the local RIA or within, within your platform. Yeah, why'd you decide to do that? I mean, it's kind of cool, right? Because there's plenty of successful syndicators out there, but very few of them actually want to share you know, their secrets to create their competition. And, and yet here you are, you're like, you know, this is great. Yeah. I've had great success. I quit my job and now when I help other people do the same thing, why did you decide to do that? Yeah, and it, it really came to the, to the point of, awareness of, you know, when I was at where I was back in 2008, nine and 10, looking for a resource and, and guidance locally to help me kind of wrap my head around the possibilities of what, what I could do. And the, the, the lack of that support really drove me to start uh, helping other people in my area to accomplish similar things to, to what I've been able to do, because uh, I don't believe that, you know, I don't believe that everyone's given the fair shake yet on, on the work that they do and being able to, to be rewarded at the level of what they really worked at. You know, that, that ability to do a small side hustle or a large side hustle uh, and be able to generate that added income in order to get yourself to a better place. Of, you know, in some people, uh, it, may be, it may be a much lower threshold, but for others, it may be significantly higher. But in any case, you can work towards that higher threshold. You just have to take a piece of it every day and, and, and act, take action on it. And over a period of time, things will happen. I, I've seen that over and over again with folks that I've helped. I've seen it happen in my professional career. It's just, you have to consciously be in a position to do it and take action. Yeah. So it's so true. We all sometimes say commit to the activity, not the outcome. Yeah. Uh, and it's so true. If we can just get our students to commit to the activity, the outcome, first deal is inevitable. And so that's been my, you know, my message now for a little while. It's just, just do it, just do it, do these three yeah. things, just do them, do them, do them, and 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 event, you know, your first deal will become inevitable. Now, but back to you. So you at one point ran out of money, right? Because uh, you yep. know, yes, you can build up equity and sell, but at one point, if you want to do a bigger deal. Now you ran out of money, so you started actually getting into the capital raising side of things, and you diversified yeah. your asset a little bit. Uh, talk, talk about what 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 you did there and, and why. Yeah, so I have uh, a, a local local group of individuals in the real estate side that uh, that deal with hard money lending and some other types of asset elements, you know, wholesaling and some things like that. So we have a little bit of a, a little bit of a variety of folks in the different mindsets, but that really opened us up to some thought processes about you know, storage units. And, you know, is that, is that a different asset class completely? It, you know, it's still a rental based thing. Yes, it is a different asset class, but it, it is still another asset class that we can invest in locally in our market with our investor base uh, that we have close to us, you know, people that want to be able to touch the assets and go see them and things like that. Uh, so that, that was our next stretch of uh, opportunity for capital. And I just happened to uh, receive uh, kind of a, uh, an operating or a portfolio package for a set of uh, storage units that are real close to, to my local market. And that, that actually came from my multifamily side where the, the, broker, the broker was affiliated with a similar, you know, with the same office company, the same corporation, but a different branch of assets. So they forwarded that over and we actually reviewed that portfolio opportunity. And it actually, to your point about the selling price actually said, this makes sense. The, the seller is just trying to sell the assets. And when we dug more into it, that was the case. They were just trying to uh, reduce the size of their portfolio because they were trying to kind of narrow their market down. So they were selling off things that were on the periphery of their general market that they wanted. So we actually uh, were able to uh, get a, get the LOI out to to the seller, and uh, they actually accepted that LOI. Put together the the purchase agreement for for the assets. It's actually two sites of storage units uh, combined of just under 300 units. So it's 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 a large portfolio, but again, it it 
required the price point where investors were needed in order to actually close the deal. Uh, one, because I didn't want to necessarily put all my own capital into the deal. And two, it, it, it allowed me to start to build this syndication platform uh, and, and provide the credibility and start uh, generating that, uh, that conversation amongst investors that are involved in it, you know, how well these particular deals are going. So we actually then, uh, we had an accepted offer just at kind of as COVID really started taking off. And what we really ran into, uh, we decided to go the SBA route uh, because we could get an 85% finance package out of it. And uh, we knew that the interest rates would be highly favorable, but we really delayed our entire execution of this thing because of the PPP loans, right? Our SBA loan kind of fell to the back of uh, all the political pressure on getting PPP loans out. Uh, but the seller was the seller was very understanding of that and continued to work with us on the deal. We got the additional extensions we needed to uh, because they they started to understand that we were in a position to close the deal. So at that point, we migrated through the the SBA loans, and uh, we were able to get in the end closed on those deals literally on the third of July. That pseudo you know should have been a holiday, but we were actually able to close that deal on the third of July. And we've been operating that asset and uh, uh, doing very similar things to what we did on the multifamily side, where we've actually ratcheted it up closer to 100% occupancy. And we continue to uh, kind of take care of and address the economic vacancy the previous owners had. And as we do that, we'll continue to push that property. And long term, we believe we'll actually end up having to add on additional storage units at both of those sites. Now you're glossing over mine in detail, Jeremy, which is, had you raised money before? And the second question is, how were you able, how much money did you raise, but how, how did you go about doing that? Yeah, so in that particular deal with the 85% financing, we did have to raise close to half a million dollars for that deal. Uh, I did fund in order to make the, the credibility of entering into this deal for the SBA and also the bank. Uh, I did put a substantial uh, piece of the investment into that, but we still had to raise over two thirds of that uh, from outside investors. So we really, we really kind of, we had a set of investors that were investing in other ways. And we, we just generated uh, conversation around what this deal looked like and what opportunities. And we had actually generated two classes of shares within this portfolio. One was a preferred class for kind of for the, for the older folks that were really just looking for some passive income, right? Steady, give me quarterly cash flow. So we had that uh, pool of funds uh, that were paying a, a good return, above average return for that. And then we were also sitting with the, the rest of the capital uh, that came from individuals that really wanna see the price appreciation on this asset as well as the returns we're expecting to, to deliver. Uh, and, and our goal is well over 15% return for this asset. And based on this previous quarter, uh, we should have we should, we should have no problem achieving that pending, you know, any any significant disruption with COVID down the road. What's the biggest thing that surprised you uh, during a money raise? The the biggest thing that surprised me was um, was really just all of the paperwork that's really necessary to get through it all and getting everybody through that paperwork. The amount of time that it takes to get everybody classified in through that uh, that funnel. Um, working with the attorney to, to make sure that we have everything, you know, all the, the T's crossed and the I's dotted. But, you know, I think what was really important and what was very successful for us is I had partnered with someone who works on the, the fundraising side and funding side, lending side for the, the wholesale and uh, the flip business. So, you know, having a, a entry point into a group of people was very helpful on a first raise. And you know, in that process now of working through the platform builder stuff, I will be in a much better position to do the next deal uh, if I choose to push harder on my own side to syndicate that. But I don't believe that I will uh, forego bringing in the business partner to help with the, the funding side because the amount of paperwork and activities while still trying to close the deal, you know, it, it just requires a bigger team. So you, you might as well have that, that full team at your hand and disposal to, to help bring all of those funds in. Now you mentioned the Platform Builder program. It's a, a program we started this year to teach people how to increase their capital raise capacity by building an online thought leadership uh, platform through automation and content and promotion. Why did you feel like you that's the, that was the next thing for you? 
Yeah, so I am, I, I'm an operator, right? I, I, we talk about the execution of these assets and being able to turn them, turn them up a notch and be able to actually make things happen. The, the side, that, side of me that is really weak is that kind of self-promotion side, the marketing side and, and the creative side on going out and, and, and pushing that conversation with other individuals that, hey, you, you know, do you want to participate in, in the deals that we're doing going forward? While my, my long-term goal was to help bring other people the financial benefits of real estate, my weakness was doing just that similar thing. So I can, I can talk to and execute a deal very well, but the promotion side has always been a gap. I, I needed, uh, call it the automation tools that really allow me to just speak and be cast out to individuals and continue to draw like-minded or like interested individuals into that funnel and just, just generate the content off of our natural activities that we're doing. And that will create the credibility to then be able to have the discussion to raise funds. It's never really been a difficult thing to, to ask people for funds once they understand your, your background and how, how really ingrained in this activity you are. But it's just trying to get that first conversation set up and the, the platform builder is, is set to be that platform for me. Yeah, in, in, in many ways, you're our ideal uh, participant in that workshop because you've done a few deals and you raise some money. You're like, crap, how do I, how do I add a zero next to that? Yep. And, and the other thing I find is that uh, uh, syndicators who come to this workshop have just, it's so great for me because they have no clue how to build an online thought leadership platform or automations or content creating. So how, and I know this is a different thing for you. How are you doing as you got, got into the workshop? How are you doing now than versus a few weeks ago? And what is your outlook? Yeah, so it, I really am seeing the the ripples start to go out, you know, whether it's uh, uh, the kind of the Facebook side and uh, I've been changing my mindset and how I'm doing some of my things to generate content from those activities uh, more than just trying to execute the operations. You know, it's similar to just doing financials at month end. It's, it's more about what content can we generate from uh, addressing these financials at month end to communicate what's really happening in the portfolio so that we can, we can continue to generate that credibility amongst uh, potential investors. Yeah. I love that. What's next for, uh, for you, Jeremy? Our, our next, our next big activity is to continue to look for, for deals that we can syndicate. I, I recently, I say recently, but it was June already added my first virtual assistant. Um, thankfully we brought her on just in time and, and knowingly that we were closing the storage unit deal. It's been fantastic. All of the phone calls are, are handled through the virtual assistant. Uh, I have her addressing a significant amount of accounting activities. So a lot of things that I used to have to handle and transition through the process are now being uh, handled by her. And uh, I really am working uh, diligently on actually a lot of this platform builder activity, uh, working with other, other folks to help generate the content and convert the content that I that I naturally produce in our activities into full fledged material that we can put out. So that that's really the next kind of two steps is find that next big deal, be ready with the platform builder by generating the, the content that uh, keeps people engaged and ready to invest. Love it. Jeremy, how can people connect with you? Sure. Uh, I, my capital raising platform is star cmg.com stands for star capital management group. And that's where we are working towards helping lots of other individuals uh, expand their freedom, uh, hopefully in the near term, but certainly uh, we can do so in the long term. Fantastic, Jeremy. Like I said, I'm so thrilled to have watched your journey over the last couple of years go from, you know, a few houses to now quitting your job and syndicating and creating an online platform. So it's been awesomely inspiring. And I hope people watching, listening to this going, I can do exactly what Jeremy has done. So thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for having the platform, the content to make it all happen. You know, if you value mentorship, okay, if you believe that working with a mentor can accelerate your outcome, then explore our mentoring program. It's at the michaelblank.com forward slash mentor. You can schedule a free strategy session uh, with us. Uh, and you might be, uh, you know, maybe able to work with uh, Jeremy directly, but we have a wonderful uh, quality, high full-time syndicators whose names you might recognize and, uh, and Jeremy is one of our early uh, students. Actually, we have uh, two, possibly three, joining us right now who have gone through our program. 
and within one or two years quit their job. And, you know, after enjoying themselves a little bit, they started getting a little bored, you know, like what else can I do? Oh, I know. Let me help others do the same thing that I've been able to achieve. And so I'm really excited to have uh, some of these students become full circle and uh, join us as mentors. So if that's something for you, check us out, schedule a strategy session call, and we'll explore whether that is right for you. Uh, the other thing uh, that we mentioned is this platform builder program that we call the platform builder incubator because we are incubating platform builders and jeremy is uh is a participant of that you can find out more about that at platformbuilders.com we open up that program ah, two or three times a year it's actually live uh done for you where we actually create your platform your automations your funnels uh all the emails behind the scene and then we're going to teach you to produce content consistently even though you don't, you're not a techie, you're not a writer, you hate the way you look on video, by the time you're done, you're going to be a content producing machine and that will allow you to raise, uh, attract investors you've never met before and raise millions of dollars seemingly effortlessly in just a few days. So I'm really excited about combining marketing with real estate. So if you're interested in that, platformbuilders.com is the place to go to find out more. Uh, put yourself on the wait list uh, for the next workshop if that's what you want to do. So anyway, hope you guys found that super inspiring. And I hope that you recognize yourself somewhat in Jeremy's journey and think that you too can do what Jeremy has done. So remember to take action, commit to the activity. Catch you guys in the next episode. Hey, and before you leave, make sure you subscribe to my channel below. We put out videos every single week and you don't want to miss it. Also, if you haven't done so already, grab my free ebook here, okay? It's a secret to raising money to buy your first apartment building deal. It's a good one, so grab that. And hey, check out another video.